Okay, we are on the line with the quickest bowler in the world. That's that's my view. It's many other people's views as well. Uh, it's absolute wheels. He's played for his country 102 times. He's taken 177 wickets. He's got three fifers at test level. He's got a World Cup to his name at ODI level. Uh, most importantly, as I said, absolutely frightening wheels. Uh, according to Shield Berry, a man believed to have seen more England tests than anyone else. Uh, this man on the on the line here is is owner of the quickest spell Shield Berry's ever seen by an England bowler. He hails from Ashington, Northumberland, Steve Harmson country, Bobby and Jack Charlton country. He's been kind enough to join us on the cast. It's Mark Wood, Woody, if I can call you that. Welcome to the great cricketer. Thank you. I feel like a heavyweight boxer there, the way you introduce us. I was ready for arms up and everything, man. That was quality. <laughs> Should do that. Get some boxing music going. Man, I, I read that I read that uh, Steve Harmson is obviously from your country now. Uh he encouraged you to go to Australia to improve your game when you were young. And sure enough, there's an article from 2011 that we've dug up uh, about you playing for Palm Beach Corumbin on the Gold Coast. Uh, so you, firstly, you've That's chosen right. a good grade club. Some of your countrymen go out to places you, you probably wouldn't choose to go to with respect to those places. And you've torn into Southport. Um, but but firstly, I just want to ask, like playing playing on the Gold Coast, great choice. Um, how many Aussies when you were there at Palm Beach Corumbin were hitting you up so that you could get them a game in county cricket? Oh, plenty. Plenty. Don't <laughs> worry about that. I mean, everyone that I played there thought that, you know, the English game was, wasn't was great and that they could walk into the first-class system and all this kind of thing. The Duke's ball, I'll smash that all over. But, um, no, it was great. I love, literally loved my time there. Um, went there three times, same, back the same club. Um, could have gone to, you know, the I think it was the, the great... I'm, I'm not sure your system, but the great team was the Gold Coast Dolphins and one year they were saying oh look do you want to come there but I, I just literally wanted to stay at Palm Beach I had so much fun Southport was one of the big rivals I think I got a first ball against it. every time I played them I'm getting a duck and they must think I'm absolutely shit but um, it, it was uh, it, I mean every t- every team if we if we batted first I would get a bit of a a bit of a bit of stick but then they didn't realise that was a fast ball. Then the next year I came, if we if we batted first, they were the friendliest lads you've ever seen. Hello, Woody, great to see you. And all this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it took them a bit of getting used to it. I remember one guy had bought a helmet from the, from the shop earlier that morning. And um, I hit him <laughs> in the head early wood. that morning. And the bolt had pinged off his helmet. And he was complaining <laughs> to me that he'd spent all this money on this new helmet. And our captain just picked him up and went, there's your bolts, mate. <laughs> There's a screw them back on his helmet. For the next ball. <laughs> well, well, hang um, on. Sorry. Woody, you, you didn't even play in the grade system. You, you played the level below grade cricket. So these poor bastards yeah. had to face like a, mm. a, a tear away Mark Wood and it wasn't even grade yeah. cricket. No, no. It was just, it was like club cricket. Um, the, the, I mean, the club I was at was amazing. So, I mean, I didn't actually do that well, you know. I mean, I beat the back quite a lot and things like that, but there was some games I would do really well, others not so well. But it was like, it was the first time I'd been away from home, from England and stuff, and it just helped me, me grow up a little bit. I mean, there's some, some great... We had a guy, I think, called um, Richard Burgess. I think he's an ex-rugby league player. And he played, and he was a stodgy opener batsman, obviously 60-odd overs, and he, he must have batted like 40 overs, so about 20. Like, guts to do it, guts to do it. And this week, I was into him all the time. Um, yeah, this, yeah, that. So next week, at training all week, honestly, he was jamming up, slapped me on the arse, come on, you can run in past that, you're going to get this guy, and you're going to hit him, you're going to hit him. So when he came in the bat, we had like three men back, short leg, slips, whatever. And he was feeling the deep square. So first ball, I'm like bowling at him, I think it was inside off stone, playing this, and he's charged in from deep square. I'm now at my mark, and he's under this guy, like, you're weak this, you're weak that, you're in this, you're fucking that. <laughs> Charge backs out the deep square so for this next fielding position. So I bomb him this time. Yeah, charges in, right knees grill again. You're not saying anything this week. Nick him off the next ball. Where are like high five and get in? This Virgil had walked him from the wicket off. You're a fucking weak prick, mate. All this kind of stuff right in the face. Honestly, I've never felt so like emotional in all my life. I was like, this is like club cricket. What's going on? But, um, fantastic. Like if if I could. Bottle up like that, like camaraderie. It actually reminded me a lot of home and, and the people there. The sort of like I'm from a working class background, and the club was very much like that. Everybody worked hard, and um, the only bits I get now is Bluey in the morning with me, me young kid. Uh, that's what that's my favourite show. So that's the only yeah. reminder I get now. But um, absolutely love my time there. 
I was just perusing uh, the 2006 stats, Woody, of Ashington CC, as I like to do just from time to time. Uh, just sort of pop in there, see what was going on. And you were, you were, you must have been 14 in 2006 that season. You were, you were batting three and bowling first change. You actually played in that game. James Harmison was playing, I presume, is some relation to Steve. I'm guessing anyway. Yeah, um, brother. Are, are, you, are you getting much chat? Are you getting much chat as a 14 year old playing first time cricket for Ashington batting three? Yep. Uh, Mark Cosgrove actually was the guy who he played at Swalwell Cricket Club, so not far from me. Um, he constantly called me noodle arms, kiddies pads. Do you, do you want to bring the boundaries in for your little fella? Um, all this kind of stuff. I mean, Alf had me to the max um, to the point where I was like, I'm going to fucking kill this bloke in 20 years time, or like 10 years time. We actually played against them at Leicestershire. And uh, I, I remember I'd done like an interview and it was like, who, if there's one player you could bowl fast at, I was like, Mark Cosgrove, I'd love to smack him straight in, 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 like, in the head. But I didn't actually, when it came to the time, I didn't actually bowl that quick. I don't know, I don't, I don't know why, maybe I bottled it, but um, I, I, he was one that I, I always wanted to get on a fast track and I never forgot the things he'd said to us as a kid. And um, Yeah, he was, he was, I mean, at that stage of my career, I was like 14, 15. I was actually just a little merry medium ball out of these little like swingy out swing things that were a bit loopy and things like that. And I was actually more of a batter. But then when I realized that people could bowl over 75 mile an hour, I was a bit like, no, oh, this is not for me. I'll try the other hand. So I managed to get a bit quicker when I, when I turned in from a 12 year old boy's body to actually looking somewhat like a little bit of a man. And then I could bowl a bit quicker. Uh, a little bit, a little bit quicker. Well, you, you've had uh, two injuries of late and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about them as well and coming back and stuff. But obviously one of the rites of passage when you have an injury as a quick bowler is to come back through club cricket, you know, come back through a lower level. Um, and you've had, you've had two in the last couple of months, as far as I can understand in your last start, uh, a lot of you saw, a lot of us saw this online. You took six wickets and it looked pretty fucking frightening to be honest for, for people who just have jobs and stuff. Um, <laughs> but the one I want to talk about is a comeback before that. You, you you come back as a bat, you know, which all fast bowlers want to do. You come back, you bat three, and you bowl fifth change. Um, what what was that day like? Any runs, any wickets? I had an absolute shocker. I, I chopped on for four. I dropped a catch at mid-off, and I didn't get any wickets. So that was a massive thanks for coming. I remember the news, and that was there, and people taking pictures. The, the worst thing for that, for me that day, was I just getting out to this left arm, uh, medium pace ball, I'd get me out, I'd try to smack him through the offside, chopped on, um, I'm trudging off, I get all my kit off, and it was during COVID time, so you're sort of like getting changed outside, took all my kit off, I'm pissed off, stood there, and the car this camera guy has missed the shot, so he's like, oh mate, can you just put your kit back on and act disappointed again, I was like, absolutely fucking not, <laughs> off, I'm, I'm spewing here, <laughs> like, no way, I, like, so they've, they've got this like picture, in the in the newspaper, the captain's like, "Look, mate, just get rid of him. Put your kid back on and act this." So in the newspaper, I'm like, sort of like fronting up with this like <laughs> frown on my face. Whereas I'd calmed down by that point, but originally I was like, "Nah, mate, fuck off. I'm not. I'm not having this." Like. <laughs> um, I, I feel like we're uh, maybe from the Australian point of view. I feel like we don't hear that much from uh, about Paul Collingwood, who's obviously a, just a wonderful player when he played, but. I imagine he would have been quite influential in your career, given the Durham connections and obviously your time in the England squad. So is, is that, is that true that we don't really hear much from Paul? Cl he's a pretty quiet guy, I suppose. I know he's been fielding coach, but he plays a pretty influential role now, but like, has he been big in your career? Yeah, I think, I mean, probably you haven't seen him because he's a, he's a ginger in he? So he has to stay out of the sun. So he's just always hibernating somewhere in the dark. Um, but I think, uh, <laughs> like for his point of view on me he's, he's been hugely influ influential he's you know stood a first step when he was captain I thought he was a brilliant captain actually um, w would often like see little bits about the game that even as a pro like in, when you've played quite a bit you, you start to like get certain tells on players and stuff he'd, he'd see something that nobody else would, would tend to see which I always thought was really good and he, for me someone that likes to play with like fun and have a smile on my face he, he encouraged that a lot he didn't want me to be too technical or overthink things. He just wanted me to run in and bowl quick, really, which um, suited me down the ground. So um, he's, he's, you know, well embedded in the England system now. And I know he did a little bit of where well, he was head coach. And I think he did well with that. But I'd always, for me, I'd always like to have him as a sort of like a number two because I think that he's so good in the system that if he became a head coach 
and he lost his job, would lose that influence and that, you know, I guess just good cricket and brain that he's got. Um, so I, I'd like to, hopefully he could stay in the system a long time and especially for someone like me who has got a good relationship with him and knows him well, it, it certainly does help. Woody, uh, speaking of like relations between Australia and England, uh, we were lucky enough to tour England in 2019 with some live shows. We caught up with Marcus North, uh, so who was director of cricket at Durham at the time uh, at Newcastle Cricket Club for a club show we did together. And then there was one bloke at the club show who sledged him. And I think that bloke never played again, but that's a different issue. Um, <laughs> a, a, a couple, it was a couple of days after Australia won the first test at Edge Baston and, and Northy on this show, like people can go back and listen to it, told us that there was, there was optional training at Durham that day. And he said, and this is his words. He's like, there was an injured Mark Wood in at the club. And he says he ran in and, and he normally doesn't make too big a deal of being an Aussie, but he walked into you and he said, g'day Woody. And you just said, fuck off Northy. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> um, and it's like, I, I liked it. Cause we, we talked to, I'm dropping names. We talked to Ricky Ponting a few, like uh, maybe last year and, he couldn't think of a, an English player that he had a beer with after an Ashes game. Um, but Australia seem to be nice blokes now, like under Pat Cummins. Like, like how are relations between the Aussies and the English at the moment? Yeah, pretty good. Um, I mean, it doesn't feel good when Cummins is bowling at your mind, but, um, <laughs> you know, generally off the field, it, it's pretty good. I mean, he, I even found, I don't know, again, because I feel like I can relate Australians a bit, from my background, um, even with the crowd and stuff out when I was playing in the Ashes this year, I felt like the banter was good between me and the crowd. I, you know, there was, you know, obviously some stuff that was a bit maybe too far on that, but I, I like to have a laugh at it. And so, I mean, there was one blog actually said that I, he thought I looked like Hugh Jackman. I was like, fuck me, I'll take that. Um, I didn't even think it was a sledge. I was just so happy with it. Um, We're soft. <laughs> yeah. There was, a, there was a guy at Hobart, I remember I was feeling on the bounty, I touched me toes to stretch my hamstrings. He was like, geez, Woody, what the fuck did you have for breakfast? I was like, Christ <laughs> almighty, this is brutal. This is fun. Um, but it was great crack though. I loved it. Um, I think generally between the players, because you play so much with each other now um, in various competitions, it's it's generally been pretty good. Um, when when the, the game at Adelaide, I didn't play and Ponton was there with, with uh, both of them, both of them, of course, is, and the chairman here at Durham. So I went over to see Beefy and say hello, and, and Ponton just came like straight over. I was like, why are you not playing? And I was honestly, I was so like, whoa, we're like, mm. this is Ricky Ponton. I kind of believe like, one, he knows me name. Two, he's like sticking up for us saying, why aren't playing? But like, it was quite aggressive. And I was like, wow, like, I don't know what to say. Like, I was a bit on edge. So I could definitely see like the old school there. But like now, you play so much with each other. Like, um, yeah, I mean, you get stuck in on that in the field. I remember I beamed Travis Head, which was a literally the worst ball I've ever bowled. And at the time I thought, oh no, this is bad. But after the after the day I went in the dressing room and the Aussies let me in and I said like apologize and stuff like that. So there was never like edge or anything like that. It was like genuine. So um you know I think as as us English lads, it's like we'll always have that rivalry with with Australia. We have a lot in common now as well. So I think on the field as long as you play hard and then off it, you know, you can just be normal people. I think that's the way to go. I think I reckon you would have played in Adelaide if you'd bowled some offies with some maybe some sunnies on. Um, maybe just got a couple of overs in. It was, it felt like that, that kind of wicket, you know. Sort of come over but, the top. Yeah, come over the top a bit. Yeah, no, but um, I mean, in that series, I mean, you had you had Dave Warner hopping. I mean, you were. I mean, you took you took nine for it in Hobart. You took six for it, didn't you in the first innings? Um, did did guys come up to you afterwards and say like that was that was that was pretty quick, or they kept their cards a bit close to their chest? Uh, no, no one really. I mean, I got that from more from Michael Vaughan, actually, who was who I think it's been speaking to the Aussie lads and a couple of them had said to him, but they never obviously mentioned that to me. Um, Marnus a couple of times had to actually tell me that I was on bowling because there was every time I was bowling, obviously, I'd, I'd get him out in a couple of games. And then it was, it was this big thing. The media it was all oh, Marnus versus Wood. Like, there's this big thing going on. To me, it was just like, he's a good player. Like, if Rudy wants to put us on, great. Um but like a couple of times I was in my own world and he was like, what are you, uh, Rudy's telling me you're on this end? I was like, this bloke, like, I kind of believe like he's actually up for this every single time. He just wants to smack me. But um, <laughs> he, he was he was someone that was always good to me. Davey Warner was someone I felt like, you know, he was very, I felt like there was good respect there. I mean, there was this thing where I had him hopping around. But if you look in the series, I only got him out once. He actually played me pretty well and survived and hung in there and then scored off me when 
when he could. So it wasn't as if like I felt like I really had one over. Plus, we were getting drummed every game. So it wasn't as if like I was like, wow, I'm bowling amazing, like we're smashing the Aussies. It was actually quite the opposite. Where I, was, I was thinking, oh my God, I've got my bowling boots on again. I can't believe I've got to charge in again. Yeah, like I've had a good one session rest. I'm absolutely <laughs> knackered. But um, it was like, it was quite brutal, but that's what it's all about, isn't it? And you've got to front up when you're playing for England. And I'm, it's good that them lads maybe had that respect and said, oh, you know, that I'm bowling fast. I put it, I mean, I still remember Lang actually shook my hand and said, respect, mate, at the end of the series. That was actually one of the best things anybody's ever said. It's not just because it was um, that he'd said this great speech or anything like that, but to have him just say the word respect as a great Aussie um, player, coach, and someone that, you know, I think he values hard work and can see that, that meant quite a lot of us. So that was that was nice. I, I want to ask you about that experience, Woody. I mean... You know, we're just two idiots off the internet, but uh, you know, <laughs> we we talk about like it's always a bit of a euphemism to say like, oh, he, you had them hopping around. Like it was more than that. You know, I, I haven't like I thought David Warner was very uncomfortable like uh, playing you, and I thought a lot of them were really like that was some of the quickest stuff that I've seen. And you, um, you know, you emerged from that ashes with uh, five stars, man. Like you, you played exceptionally well. But as you said, you guys got drummed, you know, everyone else was was struggling really. And it creates like for a fast bowler, a, a difficult situation because, you know, Joe Root wants to give you more overs because you were really effective, you know, and guys, guys were, guys were seemed afraid, you know, to, to play you, but you have this other side of things where you have to look after your body as well. And I know you're probably just going to say like, well, when you play for England, you just do anything you can to win. But um, how does, what is it like when you know you're succeeding as a quick, but you need to look after your body, even though the team needs you to bowl overs? Well, when you play for England, you do anything to win. Um, <laughs> no, I think, yeah, I think, look, I think when... I kind of closed off that option, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, look, when... It, especially for me, that's had a bad injury record. It is a fine line, but that to me, that was the ultimate series. Um, to be an English player in Australia, especially because I've been at Palm Beach, um, I really wanted to do well there. Um, so, I, I, as well as, I think for me, I probably pride myself on bowling when it's hard and when it's tough and when no one else wants to bowl. Now, the, the, the character that I'd want to be is like, I would never give up. I would always try my best and um, I was really pleased with not just the fact that I did bowl quick, but that I maintained my speed throughout the series. It wasn't like I just bowled one quick spell. Every time I came back, my speed was up, especially after not having much rest because we weren't batting well and things like that. So I was really proud of that actually at the end of the series that, you know, I'd fronted up and put in as much effort as I could. Hobart was a bit of a mixed game. I actually felt like that was one of the worst games I bowled in. The first things I got smacked, it was the first time in ever in a first-class game I'd gone for more than 99. So the first time I'd turned up, um, couldn't seem to get me runway below like 7, 8 and over then second innings I have 6 for 37 and it's like the best figures I'd had in test match cricket so it was a weird game in that aspect but like before that it was the Sydney game I, that's as good as I've ever bowled for England I mm. think I had like one or two wickets in the game so it's funny how it sort of comes around but what I tried to sort of evaluate myself on wasn't always I was disappointed because obviously you want to get the wickets but I was trying to think did I give it absolutely everything I've got? Did I wear my heart on my sleeve? Did I try my arse off? Um, and did I give it like no regrets playing for England? And that's what I was hoping to, to leave your shores with was, you know, respect of the guy that gave everything he had to try and pull it wrong for our team. And, um, you know, if I come back to Australia, hopefully in the World Cup, the 2020 same attitude, that's what I'll try and, you know, judge myself on. I'm really sorry to bring this game up because I'm sure you don't want to talk about it, but the 2019 World Cup final, um, when unfortunately you made a diamond duck um, in the uh, in the run chase there, um, but let's just—I I was actually watching the highlights of it before. It actually, it actually might be the greatest game of cricket I've ever seen. It's it's actually gives me goosebumps every single time. And like you know, I don't really care who wins because I was kind of cheering for India, if I'm honest. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but um, let's go to the super the super over. Um, where were you fielding for for Nisham and Guptal? Because I was trying to I was trying to find you in the field, and were you even on the field? Ah, you'll not find me. You'll not find me. No, I'm not on the field. I'm off the field. Um, I was sat in a dugout where, like, on the side of the field where we had like a bench, and everybody was sat on. I sort of stood on the side because um, I'd shock 
torn my side. I was injured on the side of the field. So yeah. I think the three balls left of the World Cup final of my spell, I think I bought about 9.2, 9.3 overs. I felt my side ping and Mogi could see that I was obviously bad, but he was like, look, we'll get someone else to ball. And I just thought, I just said, look, nah, I can't. This is the World Cup final. I've got to just get through it. So I bowled like my last two or three balls and then like just like couldn't lift my arm. The worst thing, I mean, I still watch that World Cup final. If you watch my dive to get in for that, that duck, it is the worst dive in the history <laughs> of dives. Like if that was Commonwealth Games, they'd give me minus, never mind, you know, one or two. It would be minus. It was that bad. Um, I still get the piss taken out of me from the Asherton lads now at home when they're like the Titanic turns quicker. You know, milk turns. <laughs> yeah, like it was just like so bad that I got so much grief for that dive. I mean, I still blame Stokes. I mean, the fact that the bloke's on like 60, 70 or whatever he is, not out. And the bloke bows him a full toss. He was sweeping Yorkers for six. The bloke bows him a full toss. He pats it the mid on. I mean, how am I, mate? Like, what's he thinking there? But I get all the stick for his. He got it wrong, but it was a great game. I hated the match, actually, If I, when I talk about it. Like, the ending is obviously unreal in that moment where you're running on the field and celebrating his class, but I hated the match. It was so tense, back and forward. It wasn't like free flow and it was stodgy and hard to get away. And, and I did grunt home best figures he had like he went for like 20 so it was like it was horrible to watch and I'm a bad watcher at the best of times so I didn't actually watch any of the the play live really I, I think as people listen to this or watch this Woody they, they cut they're probably really um they, they feel like they're watching and listening to a normal bloke you know like and I'm just thinking like after this recent you might need ashes... subtitles for you for your audience so I'm a bit I'm trying my best <laughs> to speak properly <laughs> you should see our stuff into India. Yeah. Indians are having a hard time, I think, with this chat, but we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep going. You, you, you got 735,000 uh, pounds at auction for luck now uh, in the IPL, right? And uh, like really endearingly in an article with Ali Martin, who's a friend of our show as well, you, you, you described that IPL contract like a, like a computer game. Uh, like transfers on football manager uh, like, and, and like all the comments underneath on that article are just about like what a normal bloke you are and how endearing that is, you know, to people. And what you, you've got a new book out with Vish. We talked to Vish the other day coming out in a month or so. I want to ask you about it a bit as well, but like one of the chapters in it, I think is um, to like an alternate self-help book, right? Is like how, how to yeah. stay true to yourself. Like, is it, <laughs> is it hard to take, stay true to yourself? You know, you've got labor roots from the North of England and you're getting a 735 hundred thousand, uh, contract like with luck now like is it hard to stay in touch with yourself when people bid that much money for your services uh no not really uh i don't think of it like that really um i think you know i still go to my local cricket club a lot as you know i played for them as well i have friends that are involved in the cricket club friends that aren't involved in cricket that i still have from home from when i was a kid so i think they keep you know they keep you grounded and if you ever get above your station they'd quickly you know, knock you back down. I don't think that's ever been an issue from, you know, the place in England where I'm from. I think if you're, if you're a Billy Big Bollocks and you think that you've made it or you think that, you know, it's all about this and that, there's a, there's a bigger picture. I feel, uh, yes, it's great. Didn't get us right to have that money. I mean, in Ashton, you could buy a castle for that amount of money, but like, it's, um, I think if you get too far ahead of yourself then you know, it comes back to bite you and people will never forget that. I think more importantly, you, like, Yes, I want to be remembered as a good cricketer, but you want to be remembered as a, a good teammate, a good bloke more than anything, because that's what people remember. I wouldn't want people to think, oh, you know, um, that I could bowl fast, but I was an absolute dick. I didn't think that I wouldn't like that. So um, I'd much rather be remembered as a, a bloke that tried his best and, and never forgot, you know, where I came from. I mean, you've played with some of the best players England's ever produced. I'm thinking of Joe Root specifically, and... Um, I've heard it at least at one time, he used to cut up people's socks in the dressing room. Mm. What, what, what is that? Mm. Is that true? Yeah, that is true. Um, there's also been, I mean, we've got Reg Dickerson, who was the, an Aussie from, um, I think he lives in Brisbane or somewhere like that, but he's our security. Um, there's been lads glue his sh shoes to the floor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's, I mean, Rudy's prone to like loads of stuff. I mean, when he was captain, he had to dull it down, but now that he's not, he'd be back up with these tricks. Like, but I think glued his shoes to the floor and cut, you know, holes in people's socks and the socks on. 
Um, you always have to be careful around Rudy for, for that kind of stuff. It, it's quite nice in the fact that he's got the same sponsor as me, though. So I feel like he sort of leaves me alone for the fact that, you know, we're like, I can back him up a little bit with the, we've got the same sponsor. I might get the odd bat and stuff like that. So he often leaves me alone. I, he's, I think Liam Plunkett once me had peanut butter on someone's um, kegs, on someone's um, boxers. <laughs> that didn't go down well. So um, that, that wasn't maybe a great prank when they didn't have any spare boxers. <laughs> like, a, a, I think this kind of plays into your book, right? Because like, uh, I haven't, I haven't read it because it's not out yet, but like mm. heaps of people at your level will write a book. I can only imagine that you're thinking to yourself or someone's approached you and you've thought, well, I don't want to do one just like everybody else. Right. And like, as I think a lot of great cricketers are listening to you, Woody, and they think you, th- you probably think the same way as a lot of people who play cricket and like might be tormented by the like brutality of the game, you know, like you write about boredom and you write about like how, you know, struggling, you know, you're talking about struggling to watch games because it's just, it's up and down and whatever, like, Mm. What, what what drove you to want to write this book and to also put it as like a bit of a faux self-help book? Yeah, I just wanted it to be different, I guess. Um, I didn't want it to be like a normal, like you say, autobiography. I've done this, I've done that. I met him, I grew up. Like, I wanted to be a little bit different. A few of the stories um, from like my time at Palm Beach when I nearly cut my toe off of the lawnmower, um, when I um, knocked over the captain's mailbox. I mean, in Australia, why didn't you have straight drives? Like, you know, when you pull off a drive, <laughs> They're like windy. They're never like just straight. Um, yeah, I smashed his mailbox pieces. That was in the first week that I was there. That that didn't go down well. But you know, like I feel like if if you tell a if a book is just basically I've done this, I've done that. Especially in my case, with, I played cricket, I got injured. I played cricket, I got injured. It'd be boring as shit. So I felt like um, that's another thing I've I've picked up from you, Aussies. I shit like. I remember when I played with this lad, Nelson Hart, he was called, uh, he got called Eggman. I don't know why he got called Eggman, but he was like, why don't you, why don't you ball him a bouncer and shit? Why don't you just, you know, knock his head off and shit? What's this and shit all the time? It's kind of like, uh, Uh, it's like you don't, you know that the sentence requires more detail. That's a lot of heavy lifting. You don't have the intellect or the words to... Mm like put to put it out there. So it's just a bit of a catch all term just to go. Like, I know there's more that needs to be said, but just, and shit will do. Yeah. yeah well, I, I wanted to write a book and shit. So that's, that's why I did. <laughs> oh, I understand. I completely understand. No, no, I wasn't I, sure what you meant. I, I, I know no, what I you mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to ask you Woody, about your sobriety uh, for, for those who don't know, you don't drink. And, you know, I, I was just thinking about the, at the end of the ashes when, um, Ruti and, and Jimmy Anderson and, and Travis Head and um, Alex Carey were, were hanging around at eight in the morning in a hotel in Hobart. M Wood was certainly not there. Like, what, what, um, when, when did your sobriety start and what sort of led to that decision? Uh, a mixture of things, really. I think, one, I, I didn't like the taste of beer. Um, to be honest with you, I just didn't like the taste. I think cider's okay, um, but in general... You know, I just didn't feel like I needed it. I, I could have a good time without it. And um, when we go, when we used to go out, I used to just love dancing. And people would often like, I'd go out in the bar and stuff, especially when I played for England. And people were like, Woody, can we buy you a drink? I'm like, yeah, um, just a water, I'd be fine, thanks. And they're like, Woody, he's so funny. What can we get you? A water, please. <laughs> that's vodka, isn't it? That's that's straight vodka. No, no, I'm just drinking water. And they're like, they used to think that was this big thing. I'd be like. I, I don't, honestly, I, I don't need it. Um, you know, if I'm feeling a bit exotic, I might get sparkling water, get the hops in, and, you know, feel a bit frisky. But <laughs> apart from that, like, I remember when I first came to Australia, actually in the clubhouse at Palm Beach, there was a guy who worked behind the bar. And I, I seen this last further along and she was like, she had like this like ready drink. I said, oh, what's, what's this drink? He said, she says, oh, it's a, a raspy lemonade. I says, oh, the bomb. oh, can I have a raspy lemonade? And he honestly dead set, like stopped at his tracks. He's doing what's wrong with him, mate? Uh, it's like, uh, nothing. I just want like a refreshing drink. He's like, well, do you want a Forex? I was like, nah, I want a raspberry <laughs> lemonade. Like, he couldn't get it from his head that like, oh, oh, well, I'm not a man because I didn't even drink Forex. So it's like, I just he couldn't get it around his head. But I just, I feel like I've never needed it, to be honest. And um, that's, that's the truthful answer. Um, it's not like, I mean, at house parties and stuff when I was a kid, you know, I remember I, um, you know, they would try and constantly like, oh, would he have a drink? Do this, do that. Like, I guess the cool thing to do, but 
Um, I honestly just fe felt like I didn't need it, and uh, and that I wouldn't be, I guess, pressurized into doing it if I didn't if I didn't mm. want to. Mm. Very admirable. Uh, there, there, there still are times though where people have seen you um, under the influence of other substances, but medical. And uh, the, the, probably the big <laughs> one for the last year was your your ramblings under anesthesia. Um, I think following maybe <laughs> the the first elbow surgery that you had. And mm. uh, if you if, if people haven't seen it. Just jump online, type in Mark Wood anesthesia. That'll do the job. But um, and, and there's like I watched it again today because it's a great giggle. But like, I just noticed that there's so many articles and like so many great moments from this like one minute clip. You you probably provide about five or six different things that could like create a deep dive moment. But like, I reckon the best one wasn't even picked up. And that's when like you you're complaining that even though you've had elbow surgery, it's your shoulder that's aching. And then you console yourself by saying. I'll still bowl fast, like with your eyes closed. <laughs> and then I presume it's a doctor there who says, yeah. And then you mumble and this isn't picked up. Then you just mumble, fucking hit him in the head. <laughs> and the guy says, yeah. And then you quickly ask it about the IPL, like the subject changes. And I just want to know, like, you know, cause you just come across like such a nice guy. You've obviously got, you can, I'm sure you've got the red mist, the white line fever. You, you bowl quick for England, you know, but like, you know, the, were you thinking about anyone in particular when you when you literally mumbled fucking hit him in the head? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I was in there, that aggressions, I was there. And, uh, I mean, this time, so I had surgery, obviously, this time again on my elbow, and it didn't, I told the physio not to videos because obviously I, I thought that, you know, once was funny, but twice would be not great. But apparently this time, the nurse kept trying to give me water to drink. Obviously, you have to prove that you can drink and go to the toilet and stuff. I kept telling her I had a tongue like an Alsatian and I was licking the water every time she put it in his face. So they had to scrap, they had to scrap the water until I came round a bit more. Um, so God knows what that stuff does to me and who I'm thinking of or what I'm doing, but it, it definitely affects me. Um, when I, I mean, the guy, that poor guy, I remember he came to me this time and he sort of, the guy that was asking me about the IVL and stuff like that, and he looked at me and he just instantly started laughing and like, oh, it's good to see you back. I was like, I, I wasn't quite sure who he was. So it was like that moment where, oh God, like what have I said? And then the, the physio told me, oh, that was the guy last time that, you know, I was looking after you in the room and stuff. So, oh, painful. When I watch it, it's funny, but it's painful to think like, oh, it's cringy, cringy as hell. But um, yeah, it affects me badly, that, that shit and shit. And shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, mate, there'll be, there'll be so many people out here genuinely who would love to see you for the T20 World Cup in a couple months time. I know you're racing against the clock um, with the second elbow surgery. Can you tell us, can you tell us how you're going and what England's first team, uh, first 11 will be for the first game? Um, well, I'll start with your first bit. Uh, it's going all right. It feels much better this time. Um, I had a bit of ligament that the missed last time that was stuck up with chopped that clean off, took six more bits of bone out my arm. So now um, I'm back to that spaghetti arms, noodle arms that Mark Cosgrove used to used to tell me. But I'll, I'll build that back up. It'll take me a few weekends. I'll be back. Um, but then um, the second part, start eleven. Um, we've, I mean, England. We've had about fifty-five different teams lately. So God knows what that's going to be. Um, uh, Motti is head coach, um, a guy that played at Palm Beach. Believe it or yeah, not. So I'm right. getting that in quickly. So I like called him Palm Beach as number one, get him nice and sweet, get myself back in there. <laughs> uh, so hopefully, uh, hopefully I can get my spot back. But um, we've got plenty of good cricketers and stuff going on at the minute. So especially in that one-day team, we've got a good side. So I have to work hard to get back in. Mate, I, I suppose... Well, TV you, answer. You say that TV answer straight on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you did. You yeah. sort of gave both of it. It was good. Uh, <laughs> I, like, I suppose I have to ask you about it while while you're here. You know, everyone wants to know about the future of cricket and um, apparently it's just up to players to save the international game. So, you know, who do you love more, club or country? Just just answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've, got to, I've got to stick with the mighty acorns, haven't I? Ashton all the way. I, I'm, a, I'm an Ashton boy now. That's it. After my last game was club cricket for Ashton. Got to stick my loyalty there. I think uh, the Mumbai no, Indians actually yeah. are in for Ashington this year. I think it's going to be the MI Ashington uh, CC. <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. The MI Acorns. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anything else you guys? No. No, good. Hey, um, Woody, thanks so much for joining us, man. It was a great, was a great chat. Uh, it, we, we haven't done it on the basis of the book, but because it, it, it's out in the month, we'll tell people again. So it's called The Wood Life. It's out September 15. You can get it wherever. I reckon go to a local bookshop and get it. That usually helps people out, but it's probably on the internet as well if you want it. But otherwise, mate, um, 
yeah, big, big thanks for joining us. You didn't have to do it. Uh, and, and we've had a lot of fun. Thanks, lads. Cheers. Appreciate it. And shit. <laughs>